Friends, good morning. When I came back to India after my training in cardiac surgery, that was 44 years ago, I had a very interesting and distressing experience. This was in a large hospital in Delhi, Safdarjung Hospital, some of you may know that. We used to see a lot of patients with heart disease, young people in their 20s and 30s with valvular heart disease. This is a result of a rheumatic fever, very common in India even today. But the problem for me was, these patients were so much in uh, disability from shortness of breath, they desperately needed valve replacement because the valve is beyond repair. So we had to replace the valve, for which I had been trained. But the tool to do this, that was not available. The valve was not available. All these had to be imported at prohibitive cost. And these patients couldn't uh, afford, hospital couldn't supply this free. So here was a problem which I had not encountered. All my training was in the United States. There was, I had never faced this problem there. Now, all that we could do was to give them prescriptions. You go to charities and get funds, prime minister's relief fund. This was the, the worst thing a surgeon could do. When you know the job, you are denied the tools. So then was born the idea that why cannot we make this valve here? Uh, this sounded simple. In theory, many people agreed, but I could find little support for this except long discussions on this. How to make it, who could collaborate, it went on, but there was no progress in this at all. But finally, we decided the this kind of theoretical discussion is not going to take us anywhere. Nothing happened throughout my period in Safdarjung Hospital except discussions. A serious beginning was made several years later in a small inf infant-sized institution in Trivandrum with just three people. That was later. But despite all these, we had cast the die. There was never any looking back on this. Why is it the heart valve development is so difficult? So many people were hesitant. That is because the heart valves are really one-way check valves. They permit flow only in one direction. Heart valves do the same. There are two inflow valves which permit flow only inwards. There are two outflow valves which only permit flow outwards. It's very simple. Engineering has been using one-way check valves for many, many years. But what is special about the heart valve is the environment in which these valves function. These valves are located within the heart. They are constantly being bathed by blood throughout the cardiac cycle. Now, during this, these valve movements should not damage the delicate elements of blood. That is one requirement. Secondly, blood is highly corrosive. That should not damage the valve itself. These are the two conditions. Then the second, the valve must open and close or respond to tiny changes in pressure within the cardiac chambers. Instantly it should respond. And thirdly, they have to open and close 100,000 times a day, which means 36 billion times a year. Now in the International Standards Organization, they set up the standards for making heart valves. They stipulate that a valve must have assured durability for 10 years before we can put it in a patient. Now which means this we have to demonstrate that 360 million times this has to open and close by accelerated testing without a mechanical failure. So you can imagine how tough these standards are. No wonder Baxter Museum, that's a company making heart valves in the United States, they have a museum and there you will find hundreds of models. Most of them are examples of failed models. Those which survived and brought new life to patients, it's a very tiny number. So we had a small group, a surgeon, an engineer, and a veterinary surgeon. These were the three people who finally got together and decided to make this valve. And we had the first criterion was the valve made in India must comply fully with the international standards. That was one. But the second criterion, which you do not find in the Western institutions, that this must be affordable to the low income group patients. Not only in India, anywhere in India, anywhere in the world. So affordability was just as important as the quality. 
Now, this is how we started the uh, valve development program. And you can see here, this is a successful model, which was developed and which extensively used. But the first, we had three failures during a period of seven and a half years of development. There are three components in this valve. Outside, you see a sewing ring. The surgeon puts his stitches through that. Then that metallic frame of the valve, or called housing, and within which there is a disc. Now, this disc opens and closes. That is the occluder. Now, anything could go wrong in this. The cage, for example, there could be the welding. That could fail. Or there could be excessive erosion of the metal or the fracture of the disc. Many, many complications could arise during this stage of, of development. Because the stages of development, it goes through the choice of materials, choice of a design, fabrication, functional tests, durability tests, animal tests. It goes on like this. At any one stage, you could have a failure. But if you have a failure, you have to analyze that failure, find out the cause of the failure, address that, and make another model minus that defect. Now, this process usually takes about a year and a half, at least in the Indian conditions. So we have three failures means we're really talking about four or five years of work. That's what happens. This was the fourth model. I won't go into the failures except to say that it is exacting and also a great learning experience because some of these failures in the international literature, they never publish about their failures. They only talk about the success. But failures, they are the biggest teachers. So here, this is the fourth model, which was successful. And it was implanted in a patient for the first time on 6th of December 1990 in a 35-year-old teacher who was severely disabled by aortic valve disease. This was the valve, uh, the model of the valve which was used in him. He went back home, worked full-time as a teacher, retired, now lives a retired life happily in his hometown 26 years later. This valve has been used in the 100,000 patients up to date. So it's a successful valve. Throughout this process of development of the valve, two ideas, TED is all about ideas, two ideas used to come to us again and again. Now, developing a life-saving device like this, it is really a game. And in this game, we are the players. But the adversary, our opponent, is nature in the disguise of a human body. Now, the human body, what is the human body? It is really a compartment. Out, outside, it is bounded by skin. Inside, it is bounded by mucous membrane, which starts at the mouth and ends at the rear end of the gut. So between this mucous membrane inside, skin outside, there is a compartment. This is a mysterious, dark compartment always in disequilibrium with the external environment. Only the dead body equilibrates. Inside temperature is different from outside temperature. Inside pH is different from outside pH. Now, this is guarded. That is the basis of life. But within this compartment, any introduction of an artificial material is fiercely resisted by, resisted by nature. If you put a piece of plastic, it would degrade. If you put metal, it will be corroded. If you put a foreign tissue, it would be rejected. This is the fundamental how nature guards this compartment. But nature, it challenges us in developing biomedical devices like this. It challenges us. It vexes us. It makes things very difficult for us. Ultimately, it begins to commune with us after several years of struggle. And then it steps aside and gives a little space for us to move forward. So it is not correct to say, as you know, these implants have been used by the millions, bringing new life, new mobility to millions of patients. So are we, can we really claim that we have conquered nature in this battle? That would be very fallacious. We haven't conquered nature, because all these basic processes protecting the integrity of the body, nothing has been changed. But nature has given us a little space to move forward, to bring relief to her own children. So this is an act of beneficence. It is a beneficence of nature, not conquest of nature. This is an import, important idea because there is a, a tendency on the part of uh, human beings, what is called spa, our arrogance. There is no place for that before nature. Because all these biodegradation, 
bio corrosion, they all exist. They can destroy everything. Nothing has been changed. You cannot reverse it. But we get a little space to move forward. So that sense of humility it has to be part of playing this game with nature. The second thing that we learned, we had before starting this valve endeavor in a small institution in Trivandrum, we had attempted the development of the valve in large institutions, put in a great deal of effort with no success at all. But finally, when we came to this small institution with no furniture, no equipment, no staff, there was something in the air which told us that it's a scent of success there. Soon a, a tailwind came from somewhere and things started changing very rapidly. The governance of the institution changed overnight and there was a sudden spurt of activity. New funds started coming. And whenever we, did, we needed help in solving a particular technical problem, help began to pour in from large technological organizations like ISRO. All this began to happen. And this reminded me, sometimes, in spite of ourselves, help would come. This was our experience. And this is, in some way, it is reminiscent of an airport where a weary patient, where a weary person is plodding along, and then suddenly he steps on a moving walkway, and he speeds towards his gate. He is he's still walking, but he's carried there in no time at all. Now, this happens in life. And I am reminded of the Bard's passage. There is a tide in the affairs of men. Taken at flood, it leads to success, leads to flood. And we are convinced, based on our experience, this small experience spread over several years, at these 100,000 valves implanted, we are convinced that there is a virtual law in human affairs. Given a fixed goal, an untiring effort to get to it, every person is bound to have or bound to be greeted by high tide. I'll stop there and thank you.